Thank you, Alex, and good evening. I love telling stories and jokes, but the first one's on me. You know, when I printed the poster for TEDx Bridgetown, for some reason, the word at the very top never came out, and I just saw wealth. So, you know, I thought that we were being asked to come up with solutions to our recession. <laughs> and in my wildest dreams, I imagined that what I was going to say was going to go to the Minister of Finance, and <laughs> maybe even to President Obama, and that we would here this evening be able to solve all the economic problems of the world and bring us out of recession. And then I went back to the TEDx website and I saw it was redefining wealth. So that meant I was off the hook, and I could tell the stories I love to tell. Well, in fact, I'm going to tell you that um, this script is my crib. Because I'm not as young as some of these beautiful youngsters like the last speaker. And I want to tell you exactly what I want to tell you. So some of that is going to be in these notes. But let's start with the first story, our country, Barbados. This amazing little island of Barbados, which as Kofi Annan says, punches above its weight, was settled almost 400 years ago. In 1627, a little ship called the William and John, with just four score English men and 10 Africans captured on the way over, came here. And isn't that amazing? Almost 400 years. And would you believe that a Barbadian with the name James Cisnet lived for almost a third as long as the time we've been settled? He died in May at the age of 113. And I'm making these two points because I think these two things say a great deal about us here in Barbados, this little island that punches so much above its weight. And I'm going to therefore tell you a few things not just about Mr. Cisnet, but about some of our own traditions and about some of the past. I put the facts together because there's so many ideas evoked by these two facts. Let's start with some stories about Barbados. Today, Barbados, like most of the rest of the world, is in serious recession. And most people are focused on the economy and wondering how and if ever things will get better. Well. I want to suggest that everything is linked. And I want to suggest how our material and our physical and our social and our spiritual health is actually our wealth. And I want to do it with a number of stories. First, the settlement. Let's remember that the people who settled Barbados were like any other immigrant, hungry for a better life. And as a result, we became popular almost overnight. Remember that in the early 17th century, most people, if they survived infancy, and they only had about a 50-50 chance of doing that, wouldn't live past the age of 40 or 45. And yet, people would take the risk of a six or eight or 10 week voyage, a dangerous voyage, to places unknown in order to find that new life. And so here in Barbados, land was distributed rapidly in this new country, as you can see from this early map of the 1640s, our very, very first map. And within 30 years of settlement, Barbados became the richest jewel in the English crown. Of course, it was all due to that giant grass, the sugar cane, and to the fantastic new technology of the early 17th century, the windmill, and this is Morgan Lewis Mill in Barbados, the only working mill around, restored by the Barbados National Trust. And Carlisle Bay was filled with ships, an early painting of the idea of the bay, and this medieval town of Bridgetown sprang up less than 50 years later. This is Carlisle Bay today, you can see the similarity, now historic Bridgetown and its garrison, a world heritage site inscribed by UNESCO on my birthday two years ago. I made the point that with determination and hard work, this tiny little island of ours, a forested tropical island that no one knew anything about and very few people know today except for Rihanna, 
It suddenly became a treasure trove for Britain and a global port city. Of course, it was on the back of the slave, enslaved Africans and indentured Scots and Irish, but within that story of greed and the terrible brutality of slavery, there were other stories to be told. And I use the story of Barbados, just this little dot in the ocean, as a model for others and an example of where we can go again. Joshua Steele was an Englishman. He was a musical scholar and a linguist, a fellow of the London Society of the Arts. And he was wise enough to marry wisely. He married a rich widow. And as a result, he acquired two plantations in Barbados, Kendall and Guinea. And these names represent England and Africa, Kendall and Guinea. And at the age of 80, he came to Barbados to see what was going on here and why not enough fruits of the labors were coming to him in Britain. Well, this amazing man was already an amazing scholar, but he did three things in Barbados that set him apart as a hero of Barbados in the 18th century. First of all, he was an inventor, and he invented lots of things, a new way of weaving cotton, extracting fiber from the plantain. He imported mango trees to plant at his plantation at Guinea, and he created a local society of the arts. Secondly, he created a free society for his slaves on his plantations at Kendall and Guinea. He abolished all the whipping, he paid the slaves wages, and he established a jury among the slaves themselves. But sadly, he was too far of his, uh, ahead of his time, and he never made a real impact. And thirdly, he lived here in a ready-framed wooden house, what is called Bide Mill or Bide Mill in Barbados, with his slave mistress, Stacia, and their two children. And he promoted Barbados in everything he wrote back to the society in London. He said this was a place with a climate like paradise. And all anyone needed to live happily here was a few books. And it was the perfect place for invalids. And at 80 and 90, he was still trying to, slave, to save the world, trying to change the world. He himself lived to 96 twice as long as the average at that time, and almost as long or long enough to have met our own James Sisner at 113. Joshua Steele had it all, but he defied convention, and he freed his slaves within the confines of his own plantations, which no one else was ever known to do. He was a great man and a good man in a cruel society, what I would call an 18th century model for today's 21st century. Contrast his life with another 18th century man from Barbados, Steed Bonnet, known as the Gentleman Pirate of Barbados. He was a wealthy planter's son who chose to become a pirate. I live in the house where he was born. That's another story. He built his ship, he hired a crew of 70, and he went to pirating off the coast of the Carolinas. And he's credited with inventing walking the plank. It was said that he was too much of a gentleman to run his victims through with a sword, so he let them walk into the water and drown instead. It was said that he went to pirating to escape a nagging wife. I don't believe that, do you? But he met his end by hanging in Charleston, and would you believe there's a 10-foot monument in Charleston to this wicked pirate? He was as famous in these parts in those days as our superstar Rihanna is today but for all the wrong reasons. But how did the British maintain control of Barbados and protect it from the Dutch? Well, they built forts like Charles Fort here, and Charles Fort's first cannonball hit the Dutch admiral in his chest, and the Dutch fleet withdrew. They built St. Dan's Fort, and they built barracks that housed more than 2,000 soldiers. But I plead the cause of those poor young men sent out as soldiers who died like flies and were buried in the cemetery, and of those wretched and indentured and brutalized slaves. Thoreau, Henry David Thoreau, American writer, philosopher, 
an environmentalist before Kevin Talmer or uh, other environmentalists were around or before the word was even coined. He said, most men lead lives of quiet desperation and go to the grave with the song still in them. And I mention Thoreau because he, after Christ and St. Francis of Assisi and Mother Teresa, best express the secret of avoiding lives of quiet desperation with the words, live simply, love nature, love God, and love one another. And this evening we've talked about connection. And that kind of connection is what we need. He's always been my hero for simplicity with which he expressed the truths of living a happy life, a life beyond material things. He lived in the forest and wrote about it in Walden Pond. And my own Walden Pond is the Scotland district and the fabulous wild east coast of my beloved Barbados, Bathsheba. And I weep for those who've never discovered the joys of nature's beauty. Again, we've talked about that this evening. The scents and the sounds and the scenes of our most beautiful island of Barbados and of the Caribbean and wherever you live. Of course, we can't keep a modern society going purely on these scents and sounds and scenes, but we do have a great deal more going for us in Barbados and in the Caribbean. I ask, what's the future of our past? Because our heritage, the story of Barbados, our people, both our heroes and our vagabonds, our characters, rich and colorful, the houses our ancients built, and the songs they sang, our past, can in fact yield the riches of our future. Let me explain. There are two aspects to heritage, the intangible and the tangible. And the first is in the words of our national anthem, these fields and hills beyond recall are now our very own. This is the pride and the love for the land and the people and the traditions. We've emerged from the struggles of pioneering, of serfdom, of slavery, of colonialism, of famine and poverty, and we can now take delight in the privileges we have and the beauty of our country and everything that goes with it. Not just the fields and the hills, but the ancient buildings, our food, our traditions, our whole culture, all can sustain us and earn us our living and take us out of the recession. And as Sorrow said, an early morning walk is a delight for the whole day. The beauty of a walk at Bathsheba is the breath of life. It's beauty and health in one. The other side of the coin, the tangible heritage, is the material riches of our past, built by our skilled ancestors. The monuments and the relics of the past have been the lifeblood of countries all over the world, the pyramids of ancient Egypt and Mexico, the temples of the East. Our historic Bridgetown and its garrison are now a World Heritage Site. And the changing of the century every week the collection of ancient canons and our Gothic churches like St. Mary's and St. Paul's and St. John's and St. James, they're all worth gold in economic terms. Heritage is our salvation. Both the old buildings and the old stories. The story of Joshua Steele, I told you. The story of Steed Bonnet, of Inkle and Yariko. The tragic story, the tale of Inkle who betrayed Yariko, who'd saved him from her own people in St. Vincent, and he brought her hair and sold her into slavery. And the outcome was operas performed all over the world. Hundreds and hundreds of performances of operas in the 18th and the 19th century, and reborn here at the Holders Festival. These are just many of the, one of the many, many examples of the ways that we can exploit through our filmmakers and our writers and our poets and our singers, our heritage, but many, many other stories. When tours of historic Bridgetown are organized, they attract hundreds of people now hungry for our history. Old is precious, and we're beginning to buy into it. And so I return to the scene that old 
is precious. The past is precious. Our old buildings and our old people too. They raised us up to more than we can be. And they carry the stamp, the stories, the culture of our people. And what a lot they have to tell. Because we have the highest rate of centenarians in the world after the province of Okinawa in Japan. Our study centenarians in Barbados demonstrated that all but one of 60 centenarians studied gave the credit for their long life to the grace of God. Strong religious faith produces successful coping and a satisfaction with life beyond everything, the happiness everyone seeks. The other factors were hard work, vegetables, breadfruit, and what we call ground provisions in Barbados, or real food, hard work, no fast food, and strong family and social connections. And all of them had avoided obesity, diabetes, and high blood pressure. They were really supermen and superwomen and they all lived a traditional life of hard work, service to others with compassion and faith in God, like our own record-breaking super centenarian, James Cisner. They lived the words of St. Francis of Assisi, it is in giving that we receive and in pardoning that we are pardoned. So while we are deluged around us, besieged and swamped, with all new things, the latest new electronic devices, more and more material things, every day of our lives, we must respect, enjoy, and we can exploit our past. We have a rich environment and a rich culture, and so do most countries and most communities. But we in the Caribbean are blessed to live in a veritable paradise. But if you live a life of love and service, you can make your own paradise. And so we all have the ingredients for real wealth where it counts. And so we see how the wisdom of the ages and the opportunities for the future are bound up in our past. And in so many ways, the past can be part of our future. Our heritage, these fields and hills, our traditions, our culture can work for us to bring us material wealth as well as the real riches of social and spiritual wealth, because physical, social, and spiritual health is wealth. Thank you.